just have to check the presence of everybody to start the class today anyway for that before starting i really congratulate our team of the anchors team of the persons who are behind this show and all the teachers who are sparing their precious time energy imparting the knowledge to the entire indian pgs uh, there was a demand a few days back from some senior faculty of ours that there should be a case discussion so considering that there was a you know some we had some deliberation inside the group because entirely a day cannot be given to the case discussion because all these cases will be you know they will finish within 3 4 months so it's better that we will be continuing with the this one system first suppose the respiratory system is going on almost completing now so we will be having the respiratory cases and i think the batch will be appearing for in may or june by that time we will be trying to do the maximum case discussion so that they can be very helpful to all the post graduate student before the examinations because the questions being asked here will be the almost same questions which are usually asked in the examination so i i think all the post graduates who are attending today they convey to their colleagues that it's always better to spare one to one and a half hour on monday evening so that it will help them in preparation of the exam especially the third year residents is so everyone but a third year resident must see, uh, watch these classes because it will prepare them in a better way to appear for the examinations so counting to that we are going to have a case discussion on the respiratory system today with the copd and the anesthetic strategies and i request dr ankur khandelwal to kindly moderate from here dr ankur are you there or some technical glitches are still there yeah ankur is there ankur now uh, over to you thank you so much sir and uh, good evening to one and all i welcome you all to isa online pg session and for the first time uh, as sir has already mentioned as per the demand of the students as per the Uh, suggestions of the senior faculty members for the first time we are coming with uh, long case discussions which will be definitely very very helpful for all the post graduates across the board and uh, today our first case would be on the topic uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and anesthesia strategies it will be presented by uh, dr manish mohan he is a third year post graduate trainee in the department of anesthesiology and critical care at aims jodhpur and to chair the session we have two eminent moderators the faculty members first is dr vikram bedi sir he is a senior professor in the department of anesthesiology and critical care in rnt medical college and hospital udaipur the core area of interest in of sir has been in critical care a second moderator for the session will be dr manoj kamal sir he is an additional professor in the department of anesthesiology and critical care at aims jodhpur his core areas of interest are uh, cardiac anesthesia and pain management so i welcome the uh, both the moderators wholeheartedly and i also welcome the speaker for today's session so without wasting any time i hand over the session to dr mohan uh, to begin his presentation on the topic copd and anesthesia strategies dr ankur i want to say something yeah please yes sir please sir ahead. we cannot Dr. hear from dr vikram bedi he is asking for unmute okay sir let me see Has he logged in again, Dr. Manoj? Sir, yes, I, sir. He is he's logged in again. Okay. Yeah, we we can hear. Uh, uh, can, sir, can you now. hear me now, sir? Yeah, yeah. Audible, yes, audible. sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. So, so we are starting now. Let Manish Mohan present the case. So you will take over, sir. You and Dr. Manoj. 
हाँ जी हाँ. take over from there let him present the case and we will go with the then the important viva voice बिल्कुल बिल्कुल let's start मनीष you can start now मनीष kindly share your screen share your screen Dr. Manish Mohan, are you there? Manish is there. Manish, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Manish, you are unmute yourself. Your voice is yes, not sir. audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's done. Now, yeah. can you share the screen? Yes, sir. No, no. You have to maybe go make the co-host actually. Just wait. Just wait. Yes, sir. Okay. One minute. Let me make you co-host. Now you can share the screen. please yes sir yes no. no. yeah make it, make it full screen yes sir yeah okay. fine so good evening man and all respected faculties and my dear friends and colleagues i am here before you to present a case uh, case on um, copd patient posted for epigastric hernia surgery so my patient's name is omaram he is 56 year old male uh, he is a farmer by occupation and he is a resident of jodhpur roads so his chief complaints were swelling in abdomen for the past 7 months and he also had cough for past 8 years and he also had breathlessness for the past 3 years so history of the presenting illness patient was apparently normal well 7 months back when he noticed a swelling in the upper abdomen in the midline region uh, it was incidence in onset gradually increasing in size initially it was a pea size now presently appeared at the size of a tennis ball and it decreases in size on lying down and it is associated with dull aching pain which is non non radiating coming to the history of presenting illness uh, the swelling is not associated with any a history of nausea vomiting epigastric pain or fever uh, there is no history of there is history of abdominal bloating sensation which used to relieve on taking and assess that a usg was done at a local hospital uh, hospital which uh, showed a defect of 60 mm in anterior diameter wall uh, in the epigastric region with the herniation of preperitoneal fat through the defect with no bowel loops in the hernia sac so coming to the details of the presenting illness the patient also had uh, intermittent cough with expectoration for the past 8 years and it associated with mucoid white uh, non foul smelly and not blood tinged uh, uh, expectoration with there is no variation in seasons or any postural variations in the cough and it uh, he also consulted local hospital physician for that and the symptoms were relieved with cough syrups and inhalers uh he also had his uh, history of breathlessness on exertion for past 3 years which was progressively increasing in nature uh, initially he is able to uh, climb two flight of stairs without breathlessness at present uh it but he used to say that it go, it uh, used to increase uh, during more during the bounce of cough and relieved on taking rest there's history of on and off whistling sounds during the bounce of breathlessness which is not associated with any history of nocturnal awakening with breathlessness breathlessness on lying down no history of weight loss or loss of appetite or evening rise of temperature there is no history of any syncope palpitation swelling of lower limbs and chest pain uh, coming to the past history uh, there are two episodes of hospitalization for the patient uh, for which he, uh, because of the increased cough and expectation fever and breathlessness he had which was two years back and the last episode was eight months ago <clears throat> for which he was treated with oxygen therapy via face mask and iv medications in both the admissions at the hospital and he was discharged from hospital after a week but there was no history of any icu admissions or any ventilatory support for the same initially he was on a meter dose inhaler of salmetrol after first hospital stay and now presently he is on meter dose inhaler of salmetrol and tropium and he is combined with the therapy uh, past history uh, there is no history of uh, suggestive of uh, diabetes mellitus there is no history of diabetes mellitus hypertension tb or coronary artery disease and there is no history of any non allergy blood transfusions or any surgery in the past um family history there is no nothing significant from this family history uh personal history uh, uh he is a smoker he was a smoker since last 40 years and he used to uh, smoke at least 21 packet per day 
and uh, so its pack year was calculated as 40 pack years and he is a vegetarian by diet and he has normal sleep bowel bladder habits and his socio economic status is comes to a lower middle class family general physical examination patient is examined uh, was sitting examined in the sitting position in well lit room conscious oriented to time place and person uh, he was sitting comfortably with no nasal flaring or no, he was not using any accessory muscles for respiration his weight was 68 kg height is 172 cm and bmi was 23.05 his vitals were pulse rate was uh, 80 per beats per minute in the right radial artery with good volume normal character normal conditions of vessel wall and all peripheral pulsations were palpable bp was 130 by 80 mm of mercury in right arm sitting position Our respiratory rate was 16 breaths per minute regular abdominal thoracic and temperature was affirmed general physical examination uh, there were no signs of pallor ictus cyanosis no clubbing not uh, no elevation in jvp or lymphadenopathy there was no fetal edema and his iv axis were good in the left hand, dorsal of the hand coming to the respiratory system examination uh, his chest was barrel shaped Uh, trachea appears to be central in position. There was no suprasternal or intercostal recession, nor is the uh, use of accessory muscles of respiration. Bilateral chest movement was uh, symmetrical during inspiration, uh, during respiration, and there is no dilated veins, pulsations, swellings, or scar over the chest region. Palpatory findings: all findings of inspections were confirmed, and uh, trachea position was in central. Uh, Anteroposterior diameter was 32 centimeter, and transverse diameter was 34 centimeter. The chest expansion was bilaterally symmetrical, and uh, chest expansion on full inspiration is four uh, centimeter. There was no tenderness or bony deformity, and tactile vocal fremitus was bilaterally equal but decreased. On percussion, uh, resonant sound were um, heard in all all lung fields, and normal liver tenderness were felt in the fifth, seventh, and ninth intercostal space at mid clavicular line, anterior and uh, mid axillary lines respectively. Auscultation findings: vocal resonance were equal and decreased. uh in the bilateral lung fields uh, bilateral air entry was decreased vesicular breath sounds were heard and there were mild rongi in the right middle and the lower lobes with no crepitation um so shall i continue yes first you complete your history then we yes, will sir. ask you questions yes sir okay, so so the his bedside pulmonary function test where uh, saberas breath holding time was done which was come to around 20 seconds only and his single breath count test was around 22 Uh, he was able to count till 22 and cough test was negative but his force expiratory time was 6 seconds cardiovascular and systemic examination inspection uh, uh, precording appears to be normal epical impulse was not visible there were no enlarged superficial veins and carotid pulsations were not visible on palpation the apex width was in the fifth mid intercostal space 1.2 cm medial to the left mid clavicular line no parasternal heap no appreciable thrill or pulsations auscultations were normal as one as two the sounds were heard with no murmur or any other added sound double examination of the patient in inspection there were no dilated veins no a bulge was seen in the epigastric region about 4 to 5 cm in diameter which used to decrease in size on lying down and increases on coughing Umbilicus appears to be normal and inverted, whereas palpation, all abdominal quadrants felt on, on palpations, and there was no organomegaly swelling uh, was palpated around four centimeter into five centimeter of measurement. Normal local temperature, uh, there was no uh, normal local temperature, and uh, it was non-tender. Consistency was soft and reducible. On percussion, the tympanic nerve was present. There was no shifting dullness or fluid thrill. Auscultation, the bowel sounds were present, and. Um, uh uh see in this examination patient was conscious oriented to time place and person higher mental functions were within normal limits and cranial nerve examination was also within normal limits speech was normal there was no sensory or motor deficits tone and power were also normal in the upper and lower limbs reflexes were uh, both in the both were normal in both upper limb and lower limb spine examination was uh, normal with normal curvature of spine and there was no deficits and invertebral spaces were felt on palpation or oh, coming to his airway examination uh, he patient was, was in sitting position with no visible craniofacial deformity there were no uh, nasal uh, nerves were looking normal and there were no flaring mouth opening was 5 cm with modified malambity score of uh, grade of 2 and there was no buck teeth or no loose uh, missing teeth or artificial dentures uh thyromental distance was 7 cm and hyomental distance was 6.5 cm sternomental distance was 13 cm and the range of uh, motion for the neck was uh, neck movement was adequate neck circumference was 36 cm at the level of thyroid cartilage 
and upper lip bytes was grade one. And uh, so coming to the provisional diagnosis of my case, uh, he was a 58 year old male uh, who was a chronic smoker for the past uh, 40 years. And he is a non case of COPD without exacerbation and is well controlled at present on medication. He's combined with the medication with epigastric hernia admitted for laparoscopic uh, intraperitoneal on mesh repair surgery. Hello, uh, am yes, I audible? Uh, Manish. So uh, your case is a 50-year-old male, yes, chronic sir. smoker with COPD without exacerbation. Yes, sir. At present, so, is there this no... case is posted for epigastric hernia repair. I think yes, so. Sir. Yes, so uh, what is COPD? My first question is what is COPD and how you diagnose COPD? And what yes. are the significance of COPD in uh, for the anesthesia patient? Yes, sir. sir. Actually, COPD itself is a preventable and a treatable disease, which is characterized by persistent respiratory symptom. That is one thing. And there is progressive airflow limitation, which is uh, mostly expiratory. It can be inspiratory also, which is not fully reversible. And it's also characterized by abnormal uh, inflammatory response uh, to noxious particles, basically most and primarily due to cigarette smoking. Oh. And other risk factors can also cause this, like uh, wood smoke, exam wood smoke exposure for chronic time, or any uh, other dust particles or at the work site. It can be associated with occupation also. So there are many risk factors or noxious particles which can cause this trigger, and it's a leading cause of death in the worldwide also. Now it's currently the third leading cause of death in the world. And its components basically includes chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And so, sir, in uh, anesthesia point of yes, sir. Hmm. So nowadays, uh, what is the most common cause of COPD? Why, why it is leading cause of uh, uh, death in, uh, in nowadays? So because uh, cigarette smoking is the primary, the utmost risk factor for uh, developing COPD. And uh, cigarette smoking is now too common in both in the male and the female gender. Uh, so that is one of the leading cause for COPD in most of the patients. And in day-to-day -day life, in anesthesia life, also we see patients post with COPD posted for elective and emergency surgeries. So it's important from our point of view also to know about this disease properly. And uh, other risk factors also, uh, there are plenty. Sorry, in the Indian scenario, the in female uh, genders are from, uh, uh, they're uh, very much exposed to wood smoke in their kitchen. They use the uh, wood for their as a bio uh, biomass fuel. So they are also chronically exposed to the uh, dust and the smoke and also from the occupation scenario, even from the farmers, agriculture, those who work in the industries or in the, those who are, uh, when too much of the air pollution in nowadays, uh, all these are risk factors which can progressively cause COPD, especially in the gender, uh, in elderly gender. Dr. Ankur? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vikram is not able to unmute himself. I have enabled, enabled, enabled. He can unmute. Uh, Dr. Uh, Manish, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, sir. Vikram, sir? Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, yeah. Dr. Yes, Vikram, sir. very yes, much sir. audible. Sorry. Wo class se pehle na, thoda sa karna hai. Haan, nee, nee, I understand, sir. I understand. So, Dr. Manish? Yes, sir. Uh, with this patient, uh, this patient is scheduled for a epigastric hernia repair. Am I right? Yes. Sir. What are, What are the anesthetic challenges that you feel are present in this particular patient? What, yes. Are there any any special considerations for this patient, or would you treat this patient uh, like any other ASA grade one, grade two patient? No, sir. First of all, the in the the, the basic pathophysiology of COPD is that the his airway is very high, hyperreactive. And also there is hypersecretion of uh, uh, mucus glands and there is will be mucus glands secretions will be more, which causes airflow limitation, especially airflow, expiratory airflow limitation. So one thing our concern is that there could be uh, airflow limitation and there will be alveolar epithelial damage. Sir. So it can decrease the cross-section area for uh, ventilatory exchange. No, and that is the pathophysiology, sorry, that is the pathophysiology that already exists. Yes, but do you think uh, administering anesthesia to this particular patient would uh, then result in uh, any any more problems? Because as such, you know, all these pathologies already exist in the patient. And he already has a certain degree of obstruction, certain degree of uh, uh, maybe bronchospasm and other things. But uh, you're the the uh, you're giving anesthesia to this patient or this patient undergoing surgery. Would that uh, 
excavate or can, can that be potentially a cause for concern in this patient yes sir because uh, if you are concerned with, concerns with ga in this patient would be we will be handling the airway of this patient which is uh, very hyper reactive so manipulation with airway can result in bronchospasm in the lighter planes of anesthesia so one concern is that and uh, for next concern will be the administration of ga drugs or uh, the uh, whatever technique we are concerned with the patient so both ga administration of ga and uh, regional anesthesia will be a concern for uh, for our from our point of view and it from our if you are administration ga drugs it can attenuate the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction in such patients which is a protective mechanism in them enabling for a better ventilation in them and also with the drugs that we use it can cause respiratory depressions like opioids or benzodiazepines which can uh, further aggravate their uh, uh, um, stability and it can also uh, while administration of ga um, sometimes uh, interrupt complications can also happen like bronchospasm which is the one of the most dreadful combination that we uh, <clears throat> see in drop period so managing bronchospasm okay. is also very important from our concerns okay so what 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 would you do to you know alleviate these concerns what can you do to minimize these potential hazards that uh, you feel can occur you know Yes, sir. Are there any? Is there anything? Are there any steps that you can take preoperatively to, uh, yes, you know, reduce the risk? Yes, sir. Primarily, optimization of the patient in the pre-op area, uh, pre-op time itself is the most important thing. We should uh, make the patient compliant with the medication that is already on. We should uh, patient uh, make the patient compliant with the inspiratory, uh, deep inspiratory, uh, deep breathing exercises and incentive spirometry, which will help him to reduce post-op pulmonary complications and. Uh, uh this nutritional status can be improved in the pre op area pre op time and uh, a smoking cessation is one of the most important thing if currently he is a smoker smoking cessation is the most important thing that we from our point of view that we should initiate for at least an abstinence of 8 weeks it's uh, that is what advised in the guidelines so as that is pulmonary function test and more post op morbidity and mortality will be at the least so smoking cessation would be the most important thing and uh, uh, resting could be uh, preparation would be like making in compliant to the uh, drugs that he is already on he may be on multiple drugs like bronchodilators or inhaled corticosteroids or even uh, other drugs like uh, uh, long acting or short acting muscarinic antagonists like that so uh, even uh, it's just physiotherapy uh, which will aid him uh, cough out the, or which will help him out in uh, coughing out his secretions Uh, so all this will reduce the post op pulmonary complications manish so you, you want to give him an uh, you left one thing some yes, patient sir. may require uh, treatment for, with the antibiotic in pre operative period yes, because sometimes they associated with some infection infection so beside beta uh, beta 2 agonist and all anti muscarinic drugs some patient may require uh, antibiotic treatment yes sir yes, to reduce Formative. and what is the significance of uh, uh, sputum what is the normal quantity of sputum in a patient and when you label excessive sputum what is the character of sputum it is so how it is significant how it is significant in copd patient yes to sir. help them making the diagnosis as well as to rule out other causes of copd and other things yes sir so based on the sputum from the color itself the quantity the nature of the sputum everything can uh, uh, helps in diagnosis of differential diagnosis If the cure, it said uh, we if one patient is said to have productive cough only if he produce more than 100 ml per day of sputum, and uh, if is 100 ml or at least if he is producing that much amount, it said labeled as a productive. What sputum. is the normal amount of sputum? So per day, should, per day less than around 20 uh, less less than 20 ml per day at least. Yes, yes. So if he is producing more than 100 ml per day, it should be labeled as a. Uh, uh, a uh, productive cough and it can cause uh, we can come to several dds like bronchiectasis or pul- pulmonary empyema or lung abscess so from that we can make up differential dds and based on the nature if it is mucoid or purulent we can uh, rule out the infective nature of the pathology uh, the pathology that is having if it is purulent it could be bacterial infection and underlying infection would be there or if it is having mucoid in nature it could be such of chronic bronchitis and based on the color also uh, like if it is a green or yellowish in color it also indicates of infective pathology that it can be rusty sputum in case of klebsiella infection it could be frothy pink pink frothy in nature in, in nature if it is patient is having underlying pulmonary edema it could be bare blackish in color in case of a fungal infection so based on that we can have different form differential diagnosis and form a diagnosis accordingly and treat the management also varies according to the findings we would just like to add here dr manish most of our patients are probably not intelligent enough to tell us whether it is 20 ml or 50 ml or 100 ml of sputum 
right yes sir so yes. better way to approach uh, the sputum is simply to ask the patient whether there has been any change in the amount of sputum that he would normally yes. be producing right so this patient has had cough for 8 years you say so in the past yes. few days has there been an increase in the amount of sputum he would not be able to tell us you know whether it's 100 ml or 200 ml but yes he would be able to tell us ke increase hua hai decrease hua hai secondly whether the color has changed right and whether yes. this put uh, is is smelly or not smelly now right so uh, any any uh, uh, any positive response to either of these three things a uh, change in color a change in the smell or a change in the amount of sputum would uh, should alert us to the possibility of a infection yes right so uh, now now that you you pre uh, you know you've optimized your patient pre operatively you've started them on physiotherapy you've placed this patient on bronch so what what are the bronchodilators that you would want to start supposedly this patient wasn't taking any bronchodilators so any any particular bronchodilators that you have in mind and uh, why yes sir. bronchodilators there are two types there will be short acting uh, like a beta agonist drugs it should be short acting beta agonist and long acting beta agonist drugs like uh, short acting there will be salmetrol uh, uh, salbutamol and uh, uh i long acting uh, beta agonist like formatrol and uh, uh formatrol will be the long acting beta agonist drugs and uh, other uh, bronchodilators like uh, uh, long acting and short acting beta uh, uh, anti muscarinic agents like uh, um ipratropium and thiotropium the uh, mdi inhalers they can use and uh, they might be on also on inhaled or uh, inhaled corticosteroids also we can use sir and um, So yes, sir. These are the some drugs that uh, help us to optimize. Any of systemic steroids in this particular patient, sir? Uh, long, uh, yes, sir. Prednisolone can be used. Uh, maybe some patients may be on prednisolone. Uh, in this patient, in this patient, do you think there is any 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 role of a systemic steroid, prednisolone uh, in this particular patient? This patient who is uh, scheduled to undergo an epigastric hernia repair, and uh, yes, you sir, said that uh, and can uh, climb to uh, two flights of stairs a week. Uh, right. sir is a uh, meds is good and is uh, is a uh, even in copd grade is comes to a good classification of be a, a second grade only so it's not a severe and it's not posted for a major surgery also so there is no need of uh, uh, we can supply if he is on uh, pred- uh, uh, prednisolone or steroids on the preoperative period we can supplement a basic uh, whatever quantity he is on that no, we can supplement otherwise the will continue but if he is not on any steroids then this this is not a case not where we would do systemic steroids had it been severe copd or had it been a major surgery yes, sir. then probably that is or uh, systemic steroids yes, in that so case so supposedly you start this patient on salbutamol inhalation uh, would you want to alert this patient to certain uh, adverse effects i mean yes, supposedly sir. The- yes sir uh, beta beta agonist drugs are its own side effects like it can most common is hypokalemia Uh, uh it can cause tachycardia in patients and also tremors tremors is one of the most common that the patient will have mm-hmm. so from our point of view is that we uh, from our point of view it's we are concerned is hypokalemia because long term use of such drugs can cause hypokalemia and also it can precipitate dysarrhythmias in patients so these are the two things that and also tachycardia these three things are the most important point of concern patients who are on beta agonist drugs so now what what is what is the choice of anesthesia that you have in mind Yes, so choice actually depends on whether the based on the patient's clinical status and also the based on the surgery what type of surgery he should undergo and the duration of the surgery. So in this surgery, though it is an epigastric surgery, patient is posted for laparoscopic uh, hernia repair, and it's an upper abdominal surgery. So my choice of anesthesia in this position will be to provide general anesthesia uh, with uh, uh, securing his airway with a supraglottic airway device, especially a second generation, preferably a second generation device. with controlled mechanical ventilation and uh, for pain i will be choosing multimodal uh, and uh, multimodal analgesi for this patient sir so i will so prefer general anesthesia in this patient you do you agree manoj yes 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 <laughs> post op mein kya manish sir uh, for since uh, the Um, incision is very small; it will be limited because it's a four to five centimeter defect only. So I will be for pain. I will be infiltrating local anesthetic at the incision site, and also I can go for uh, lesser invasive uh, uh, region anesthesia technique like ultrasound guided ESP pain block or ultrasound ultrasound guided subcostal uh, tap block. Also, I can uh, go for with. Uh, there is no need of an epidural analgesia in this uh, patients. I 
because it will be too invasive for the patient it will be uh, very much uh, possibility it will be good it, there will be no pain but uh, when the pain can be managed with uh, superficial regional blocks i will go with that so, since the incision is too small so uh, multiple as with uh, iv iv agents also what iv agents sir uh, iv agents most commonly will use paracetamol uh, along with that we can go and if is kft sir within normal limits in this patient it's normal so i will i can prefer uh, nsaids also and uh, if, if with that also if the pain is not subsiding we can go for i show a small dose of iv patient controlled analgesic uh, pumps based on sure uh, fentanyl opioids also sir if the pain is too much not controlled only PCMI, what PCMI. are the what are the bedside pulmonary function test or whether you advise uh, spirometry in this patient or not on on which patient you advise the spirometry or uh, uh, arterial blood gas analysis in preoperative area yes sir so the various uh, bedside fun- pulmonary function tests that we can do in this patient is uh, first of all we can uh, check his breath holding time that is subrox breath holding time we can ask the patient to inspire for uh, inspire and hold as much as possible so normally patient can uh, should patient should hold about 25 seconds if it is less than 25 seconds it indicates that cardiopulmonary reserves are poor less than 15 seconds it means it's very poor cardiopulmonary patients uh, reserve is very poor so in such patients where cardiopulmonary reserves are very poor all these uh, other uh, pulmonary function uh, bedside pulmonary function test like breath single breath counting test in which a normal patient will be able to count until, until 50 whose counting is less below 15 means his uh, vital capacity is still very poor so in such patients whose bedside function tests are deranged we can go for we should definitely go for a pulmonary function test uh, which is done by the pulmonary department and uh, whose ecg also shows uh, variations which are suggestive of right ventricular strain pattern in such case also which and uh, patients who are posted for thoracic and upper abdominal surgeries also definitely we should go for a pulmonary function test other than bedside pulmonary function test in which uh, copd patient you advise for echocardiogram so uh, uh, yes sir patients who is uh, 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 based on sir uh, pulmonary function test and post bronchodilation therapy the a uh, global uh, uh, initiative for obstructive lung disease has se- classified the severity of copd so patients who are faces uh, of right uh, right heart failure or in ecg which is very evident that uh, they have uh, right ventricular strain pattern or p pulmonary or uh, whose uh, r waves are tall in pv1 and v2 segments so such patients we should definitely go for echocardiogram and who have grade of severe grade 3 or grade 4 category in board classification should definitely go for echocardiogram to assess the right ventricular uh, to also to see pulmonary hypertension and also to see right ventricular failure signs so what would you do to alleviate so when, that? whenever the disease disease is very severe or patient might having signs of failure you can advise the uh, echocardiogram in preoperative area and besides sepsis test which other test common test use, uh, usually used in preoperative clinics in day to day practice besides sepsis breath test yes sir uh, other than this test we can use uh, uh... Uh, force expiration time can be assessed in these such patients we will ask him to take a deep inspiration and using the stethoscope which place over the trachea we can uh, uh, look for the uh, time for which the expiration uh, takes place normally he might know that expiratory audible sound will be heard for 3 to 5 seconds yeah, anything which is prolonged more than 6 seconds suggests that there is expiratory airflow limitation so such patients can be diagnosed as can be cat- uh, categorized as ucd patients and also snider's match blowing test is one of the Uh, earlier which you used to do earlier what is time. most common test what is most common test used in preoperative clinics sir cuff test also we can use cuff test uh, in which we ask the patient to take a deep inspiration and to cuff out maximally as possible in which we assess the strength of the cuff in which uh, if it is effective or not whether he is able to uh, uh, cuff out properly or the, we can by which we can assess the um, strength of the muscles and the, from which we can also assess the peak respiratory flow rate also can, and can you ask the patient to walk can also ask the respiratory rate yes, can, can you ask the patient to walk for a while will that tell you something yes sir that uh, that we can, from that 6 uh, minutes walk test is also there from which we can uh, assess the uh, uh, oxygen consumption of such patients in 6 minutes 
yes sir in pre in prime pre pre op area or in the pre psc clinics we can ask the patients to walk a distance of uh, 30 meter which is kept apart by two cones and we can ask the patients to walk with a pulse ox uh, mobile uh, Um, finger pulse ox which can be attached to the patient and uh, a normal patient will in 6 minutes will be able to walk around more than 500 or 600 approximately 600 meters but in patients uh, who is at least uh, who can walk up to 450 meters it's said to have a oxygen consumption of more than 15 ml per kg per meter square sir in which which indicates that his cardiopulmonary reserves are good and its uh, uh, metabolic equivalence of task is also good more than 4 uh, so what are the concern of steroid inhaler in perioperative period yes sir Because steroid is the patient are on steroid chronic uh, steroid uh, inhalation so what are the anesthetic concern with that yes sir uh, so there are major side effects adverse with the steroids intake it can cause uh, central obesity is one of the most important side effect which can cause uh, uh, pad of fat in the nape of neck or buffalo hump in the nape of neck which can uh, create a difficult uh, airway situation for us from in our point of view and it can also cause hyperglycemia hypertension and make the patient poor for osteoporosis and uh, decreasing immunity is one other important concern from our point of view and it can also cause uh, oral airway candidiasis and a poor wound healing uh, so these are some things which are our point of view to be considered sir and what is the significance of smoking or uh, uh, pack what how we calculate the pack years yes sir pack year can be calculated as the number of packets of cigarettes that he uh, smokes per day into the number of years so anything more than 40 so if he is smoking more than 40 years means that his pack years is obviously more than 40 sir so such patients are high risk of, prone to develop high risk of post operative pulmonary complications there will be they we expect post operative pulmonary complications in them and also we can calculate the smoking index in some patients based on the number of cigarettes that they smoke per day into the um into the number of years so based on that we can classify them as mild moderate or severe heavy smoker if their smoking index is coming less than 100 they are mild smokers uh, if it is smoking index more than 300 means they are heavy smokers and in such patients we expect a risk of uh, adenocarcinoma of lung in such patients also so uh, post pulmonary pulmonary complications associated with them whose pulmonary smoking index is more than 300 will be also very high sir and what are the other risk factor for development of post operative pulmonary complications so there could be patient factor as well as surgical factors patient factors means whose age is more than 60 years of age whose asa grade is a classification is grade is of more than 2 whose uh, um uh, preoperatively whose uh, have signs of cardiac failure or especially right heart failure or uh, features of core pulmonary and whose uh, um whose albumin levels are already low less than 3.5 mg per deciliter it's itself is a predictor of post operative pulmonary complication and from surgical point of view uh, patients who are posted for uh, upper abdominal surgery or intrathoracic surgery um, and whose duration of surgery will be more than 3 uh, hours providing ga for more than 3 more 3 hours uh, can increase the risk of and patients who are posted for emergency surgeries also in such patients we expect more pulmonary complications Beside this, uh, surgical site is also important. 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 Surgical site post operative pulmonary complications so you you mentioned a uh, uh, several techniques for truncal blocks you know you mentioned a rector spiny yes, block a possible tap block yes, probably sir. a couple of others so which which of these uh, you know three or four truncal blocks do you think would be uh, most helpful in this patient who is undergoing a, a laparoscopic uh, hernia repair yes sir so since the or would you want to use a combination of a couple of blocks sir i will use a, uh, only one regional block preferably i will use a subcostal tap block uh, uh, in this patient because the region the site of incision is the pores will be in the upper abdomen so uh, kind of from the conventional tap block uh, if you are providing subcostal tap block it can cover the uh, areas of uh, surgical port incision 
much uh, better than the conventional tableau and uh, if not if the, the provider the institution uh, institute is not familiar with the subcostal block we can go for esp brain block also sir which is much easier to provide under ultrasound guidance we can also cover the uh, surgical site port site area bilaterally if you are giving bilateral esp See, the port block. sites the port sites would anyways not uh, really cause cause too much of pain as such you are doing local infiltration for yes, sites sir, uh, would you consider a rectus sheath block in these patients Sir, uh, rectus sheath block, uh, yes, sir, it can also be considered in this case. Uh, since because rectus sheath block would be much better because that is where the surgeon is going to place the mesh. The okay. ports, anyways, are not going to be the cause for concern because you're going to infiltrate those ports yes, with uh, local anesthetic anyways. So it's where the surgical yes, manipulation sir. takes place. The rectus sheath block would, in my opinion, be uh, a better alternative amongst all the uh, tranquil blocks that you've been uh, talking about. Would you want to reserve this patient uh, a bed in the ICU? Would you want to tell your colleague in the ICU that you have to keep a bed in the ICU? This particular so, patient. Would... So in this particular patient, I don't expect that much pulmonary compli post pulmonary complications because uh, uh, first of all, I will not. Uh, uh, I will let. Uh, I will approach with a supraglottic airway devices. I will not be manipulating uh, the airway with an endotracheal intubation in this patient. So uh, in supraglottic airway devices, uh, there is less chance of bronchospasm or airway manipulation. So. Um, it's easy to extubate and we know from the ventilator in such patients also. And moreover, it's bed cell pulmonary function tests are not that bad in this case. So, and even is a, um, uh, most of the pulmonary function tests are not that bad. So I don't expect, uh, um, uh, uh, not expect to reserve a bed in the ICU for this patient. And uh, moreover, it's a laparoscopic surgery, sir. So uh, uh, if it was an open surgery, the patient would have more pain. So it's a, being a laparoscopic surgery also we, it will be easy for the patient to mobilize and to take respiratory efforts will be more easy for him to take in the post. Agreed, agreed. So there's, there's a question from one of the participants and it says that why would you want to use controlled ventilation within SGD in place? You want to reply to that or you want us to uh, take that question? Uh, the question all, is why would you want to do con uh, want to use controlled mechanical ventilation? Uh, that, that's a question from one of the members of uh, one of the participants, one of the audience. Why would you want control so ventilation? In case of a laparoscopic surgery, uh, it will be difficult for the surgeons if the patient is on spontaneous ventilation. And moreover, for infiltration, Great. for infiltrating the pneumo, creating the pneumoperitoneum, also the surgeons may be finding it difficult. And uh, for the patient side, also, if there is adequate muscle relaxation, also there will be less stimulus. And in, because we, we, we are already creating a pneumoperitoneum, we can push the diaphragm cephalad more. And it can uh, so. Better there will be if there is more relaxation, it will be better for the patient as well also for the surgeons. So, Manish, uh, it's not about the controlled ventilation, it's about the use of supraglottic airway okay. devices with controlled ventilation in laparoscopy surgery. The size of incision may be small, but the, it depends upon the skill of the surgeons also, how prolonged the surgery can be and how many times what you feel when the incision is there, the hernia is big. Then uh, small, it may be coming out small on the ultrasound if you, whatever the uh, imaging you have done. But when you open the abdomen, the hernia is sometimes quite big. And you are using a supraglottic airway devices with controlled ventilation, with laparoscopic surgery, where the position of the patient has to be altered. There are chances that supraglottic airway devices may deviate, may get displaced. There may be chances of respiration. So many risk factors are there. Why not controlled ventilation with the endotracheal tube? Uh, sir, actually, we can uh, go for endotracheal intubation also, but in this case, the uh, uh, patient will not will be mostly in the uh, reverse trundleberg position. So it will be if it was in a reverse trundle, normal trundleberg position where with a head down position, I will obviously go for an endotracheal intubation. But uh, since my patient will be in a reverse trundleberg position with the head up position, uh, I don't expect that much of pressure for uh, slipping slipping away or leak from the supraglottic airway device. So that's why I chose a supraglottic airway device for this patient. If uh, if it was any other type of surgery involving the head down position or trundleberg position, definitely uh, securing the airway with endotracheal intubation will be the ultimate and the primary choice with control. So in this case, in this case, you want to avoid the airway manipulation. Airway airway because airway. these patients are more prone for uh, laryngospasm or some bronchospasm. Yes, and uh, nowadays, lots, uh, many types of supraglottic airway devices are available which provide uh, better seal pressure. Yes. So we can safely go for uh, uh, supraglottic airway devices. 
and i nowadays literature is also supporting that we can use safely supraglottic airway devices uh, in laparoscopic surgery also yes. moreover i i feel that uh, the risk of uh, an airway event occurring uh, air, airway hyperreactivity or bronchospasm is much greater when compared uh, to you know a leak occurring with the second generation sgd in place a well secured second generation supraglottic device so therefore uh, the risk benefit ratio is much better with the use of an sgd uh, even in laparoscopic surgery when compared to an endotracheal uh, intubation in these patients so manish uh, how you premedicate this patient because now this is patient is posted for a laparoscopic uh, epigastric hernia repair so what premedication do you want to use in the, uh, in this patient Yes, sir. In the preoperative, uh, in the preop day or itself, we can uh, give patient a tablet of point alprazolam, point two five mg. So, anxiolysis part also it's very important for the from the patient from our point of care to relieve his anxiety and to act, uh, to get into a rapport with the patient. So, in there is no harm in in this particular patient to give a pre medication in the preop day and in the um, on the day of surgery in the preop period also we can pre medicate. The patient with midazolam 0.02 to 0.03. Uh, Is any other drug you want IV. to use uh, uh, beside the alprazolam? Uh, so lorazepam also we can consider. Wait, any other type of drug, like I some uh, um, proton pump inhibitor or like that antacid. Yes, the preoperative day it's, uh, also we should uh, consider the. Proton pump inhibitors like pantoprazole and of uh, procantic metoclopramide also can be considered uh, in this patient uh, to uh, uh, decrease the chance of uh, gastric and reduce the gastric content volume. And uh, on the day of the surgery, uh, if in the controlled environment uh, under monitored care, also we can premedicate with the IV benzodiazepine. There is no harm uh, in giving uh, midazolam in this patient. But and, uh, we should be judicious with the dose and we should be given in a well-controlled environment. Any, any specific reason why, would you want, why you would want to use benzodiazepines in this patient? I mean, uh, probably you use it in all your patients, alprazolam or midazolam, whatever. But in this subgroup of patients, it becomes even more important that you use an anti-anxiety drug prior to the day of surgery or on the morning of surgery. Uh, can you tell me why? Sir, because these patients are more prone for uh, respiratory depression with the opioids and uh, there is a risk of uh, respiratory depression with benzodiazepines also. Uh, so why would I use benzodiazepine anyways then? But these uh, patients actually are more uh, you know, uh, candidates for using benzodiazepines. Uh, you should not forget to use a benzodiazepine in these patients. Can you tell me? Because most of these patients, uh, this is, it's because most of these patients have a certain degree of dyspnea breathlessness. That itself leads to a lot of anxiety in these patients. Right? So, it's, uh, so that therefore, it is very, very important that you administer an anti-anxiety uh, drug in these patients, right? Because of the dyspnea, because of the air trapping, uh, these patients are more anxious when compared to uh, others, right? So it's very important that you use a benzodiazepine. Manish, I have one query here. So, you are making all the plans, beautiful plans to manage this patient. You know, the preoperatively, you are going to do this thing, that thing. Now you have done the PAC in the morning, this patient. At night, you are posted for your night duty in the emergency ward. And suddenly, this patient comes to you with a severe obstructed and strangulated hernia. Okay. Now, whatever advices you have given to this patient, now what will be the change of plan, the anesthesia strategies during night time when the patient is non-fasting, coming with a strangulated hernia, I think must be history of three, four hours. And what are you going to do now? And you are, you know, in the third year PGs, majority of the medical colleges, the consultants are on call, the third year PGs are managing the cases in these type of situations. So how are you going to manage this case? Yes, sir. Suppose the patient will be coming in as an emergency, so his NPO will not be adequate. So I will consider him as a full stomach patient. So that will be the one concern and the patient will be very anxious and he may be hyperventilating. Uh, already his vitals may be elevated. And uh, since the patient is a, now it's a diagnosed case of obstruction in which 
uh, we uh, there is uh, non obstruction is there so there is high risk of aspiration in such patients so starting from the uh, pre pre oxygenation itself and pre med and, and uh, in the anesthesia technique itself i will definitely go for a uh, plan for, to intubate this patient with a uh, modified rapid sequence induction with uh, an endotracheal intubation in this patient as the risk of aspiration is very high i want to secure the airway with an endotracheal tube and uh, that that would be the changes that i should consider in this patient and uh, um other than the routine um, so here here, here one one thing you uh, after my this question i think dr amita potter is there to ask the question this patient dr vikram has already asked will you reserve a bed for this patient nice you now at night time majority of the issues suppose you are working in a government college like aims jodhpur i don't think so it's easy to find a bed in the icu so what are your strategies to plan for a surgery in this situation when there is no bed in available in the icu that's a very general i think condition we follow we face nowadays na so make that plan yes, sir. so so if there is no icu bed it's a uh, so my starting from the induction itself i should be very cautious not to uh, create uh, manipulate airway with that much uh, it should be airway manipulation whatever i am going to do we should be done under deeper pains of anesthesia so there should be adequate pre oxygenation in this patient uh, with providing more time for pre oxygenation and while uh, starting from the induction also i should consider uh, uh, is a him as a case of full stomach so there is high risk of aspiration in them i should go for modified rapid sequence induction in this patient with we can make the patient in the semi recumbent position uh, so as to avoid uh, this thing and we can uh, provide a mild, a mild peep in the pre oxygenation uh, period to so that it can uh, uh, better oxygenate the patient and uh, uh, improve its oxygen reserve so after uh, 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 we'll intubate with a rapid sequence induction, and uh, after securing the airway uh, uh, with an endotracheal tube, also it should be uh, inserted under deeper pains of anesthesia. So that is one of the most important thing. It can reduce bronchospasm in such patients. Uh, I can consider uh, manuals like uh, um, intubating him under proper death by. It can be more. monitored by bis also so considering bis monitoring in yeah, this patient uh, like manish uh, uh, so i would probably i doubt whether you would have access to bis at 1 o'clock in the night in the emergency ot uh, i think what you should be doing here is see any ways you'll have to put in an endotracheal tube yes, by an rsi once you put in the endotracheal tube there are two or three things that you can do to you know uh, uh, to hope uh, to try to minimize this the patient get to the icu Uh, one is the use of uh, uh, bronchodilators uh, second is to ensure a uh, very good pain relief by use of a regional block or by use of pcm multimodal analgesia whatever and the third is to ensure that you know when you when you extubate this patient this patient yes. should be sitting and awake right when you uh, extubate this patient this should be patient should be uh, awake and should probably be you know sitting by a little bit uh, you know in a head up position you extubate that patient Uh, you use bronchodilators so you uh, ensure very good post operative analgesia and you keep on praying to god right that is what you are yes manish there is question uh, question for you in the chat box h2 blocker or ppi which one is better sir um, um sir h2 blockers uh, like uh, ranitidine uh, ranitidine will be more uh, efficient in Uh, reducing the ph of the gastric content because ppi will be uh, uh, will not uh, will not reduce that uh, it will just neuter reduce the secretion but to the volume will be more reduced with an h2 blocker as i recently and also we can uh, uh, give metoclopramide in such patients to as a prokinetic agent to reduce the gastric volume so uh, a majorly a combination of metoclopramide with the ranitidine will be much efficient in this patient Uh, rather than giving ppis uh, manish you uh, you have a few more queries uh, can uh, will we, uh, will you uh, be comfortable in using magnesium sulfate in such kind of patients intraoperatively prophylactically would you be comfortable in using maxalf sir uh, prophylactically uh, Mm. So, prophylactically, uh, 
there is no practice like I, personally i have not seen a practice like that but uh, uh, in case of a bro- intraoperative bronchoscopy which is happening uh, we can consider uh, bro- beta uh, bronchodilators like metadose in uh, uh, salbutamol and uh, formotrol or long acting agents can be used if it's not not relieved on uh, initial drugs like uh, beta agonist or uh, thiotropium or like uh, anti muscarinic agents also in such cases we can consider magnesium as a last resort to relieve bronchus intraoperative bronchus spasm at a dose of 50 mg per kg over 20 minutes of iv infusion can be considered and uh, prophylactically use uh, have not practically have not used them. what i think uh, the he's a third year resident the moderator should come for help or all the senior faculty whenever the answer question is difficult uh the senior should come forward to help the presenter because the whole idea of these case presentation is to allay the doubts and fears whatever come in the mind of the final year pg student so this is a very good platform and good question is not a bad question and he is trying his best to answer but whosoever is there they can raise their hands or they can you know unmute themselves and give the suggestion or they can answer on behalf of our presenter dr manish mohan so it is an open forum so just to make everybody ready for the case presentation during their examination so i have just uh, typed in the chat box also either unmute yourself or just on your video or you can ask the question so with regards to magnesium i would just like to add to what you said manish magnesium i feel is best used in an ad- as an adjuvant as an adjuvant bronchodilator when the other things may not be working adequately so yes definitely magnesium sulfate maybe 8 millimoles would be an option but that option should be exercised only uh, once you are through with your inhaled bronchodilators once you are through with the uh, with the dose of a systemic uh, intravenous uh, steroid and still you feel that the bronchodilation is not enough still there is air trapping uh, it is only then that you uh, may use magnesium sulfate because remember magnesium sulfate would come with its own set of problems this patient uh, once you have intubated this patient this patient obviously is on uh, on ndmrs so they would uh, be a, a possible prolongation of the action of ndmr you really uh, would uh, would uh, want to then you know uh, monitor the urine output uh, the knee jerks so all those things so uh, loading up a patient with magnesium does it have its own uh, set of uh, problems therefore at best it can be used in a juvent that is what i feel uh, the other faculty members are i would uh, love to hear their inputs on this one manish any faculty member yeah yes uh, sir uh, please uncle, uncle just one minute manish there is one very good this one question about in case of emergency can't we go with the subarachnoid not blood with epidural avoiding ga so now since we are not Uh, resorting to the laparoscopy at night uh, if you are comfortable with thoracic epidural rather than with the lumbar epidural and giving larger doses of epidural uh, this one anesthetic to achieve the higher effect so i think if you are comfortable with thoracic and rather than uh, going with the ga is much safer at night in case of, because the uh, surgeon is going to open the abdomen and you require a little bit higher thing but in case of uh, COPD inevitably we get a patient with the pulmonary hypertension also. So the difficulty of the regional comes in those cases where the pulmonary hypertension is of severe, you know, uh, quantity and which has uh, even echo has not been done. You have just uh, seen the case in the PAC and coming to night to you in emergency. So it's very difficult for such cases. So these are very good discussion going on. One Dr. Pritika was there who has raised hand. She yeah. can unmute and she can uh, ask the question. ankur you just keep on seeing who's ready yeah 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 sir dr pritika kindly unmute and please ask your query anyone is having any query please raise your hand meanwhile i'll i'll just take one query from the chat box there is uh, same question is being asked and asked again and again uh, for your elective case can you get the case done in segmental thoracic spinal anesthesia this is the it's the question being repeated again and again segmental thoracic spinal anesthesia for your elective surgery as a sole anesthetic sir so, if the anesthetic is 
Brand is an expert in that uh, uh, technique of uh, providing the uh, an uh, segmental spinal or uh, uh, epidural low dose epidural. In that case, we can of course they they can provide continue to provide with the segmental spinal. But there are pros and cons in uh, providing regional anesthesia techniques to such patients because uh, the administration itself can cause uh, segmental spinal at that level in the thoracic level can cause the nerve root damage, which uh, if the uh, and if there is not that expert in that case it's a uh, expected complication and also providing uh, regional anesthesia to a, a patient for hernia surgery especially in the upper abdomen surgery it can cause uh, uh, more uh, it can decrease the frc and also the respiratory muscles can also go uh, undergo some relaxation which can decrease the overall functional residual capacity of such patients and uh, the patients it may not be comfortable for them to lie conscious for a long time if the surgery goes on and it can also if the if any stimulus factor which can provoke bronchospasm in patient it will be very difficult to manage bronchospasm in a patient who is under regional anesthesia so considering uh, these factors it should be if the anesthetist is very expert and in providing um, this such technique which can go for but it should consider the both the pros and cons just to add to that the efficacy the safety of segmental spinal Uh, uh for epigastric hernia surgery needs to be proved first in asa grade 1 grade 2 patients before we go on to you know apply uh, this technique i'm sure people are doing it and i'm sure they are doing it very well i i i hats off to uh, to the competence uh, but then uh, for somebody like like me for example who is not very conversant with the technique i would uh, uh, rather avoid it before i get to uh, practice this and establish the safety in uh, asa grade 1 patients uh you know before going on to uh, try this in a patient of uh, moderate copd posted in the night when obstructed epigastric hernia yeah agree to sir uh, dr vikram sir agree to you because segmental spinal is not being universally followed with the same intensity same quantity same quality everywhere in india and most probably uh, probably the teachers we are not comfortable as senior teachers because it has been devised only in the last 7 or 8 years and how the things will be going and the, what the risk associated with this thing they have to be taken into consideration so i think <clears> it's <throat> part of the senior during elective surgery to guide the pg students how to go about such cases rather than just resorting to segmental ha definitely where the people are very much comfortable who are doing practicing it every day i think it's a much much safer option Uh, there is one more good question in the chat box which ventilator mode will you prefer intraoperatively will it be a volume control mode or a pressure control mode if if i am using a muscle relaxant does it really matter sir uh, sir in case of both uh, modes like the volume control or the pressure control are accepted there none no where it has been uh, It said that we should go for the volume control over the pressure control. But ideally, what I prefer will be a pressure control mode of ventilation in COPD patients because uh, there is a we can use pressure control mode. We can restrict the pressure and uh, the but the volume that the ventilator deliver will not be restricted. So we can limit the pressure and avoid the uh, uh, risk of rise in airway pressures in such COPD patients. We can limit the barotrauma associated with that uh, raised airway pressures. So that one thing could be there. uh but it should be we should try, definitely monitor for the tidal volume that it is being generated so if it is over uh, generating more tidal volume it can cause uh, volume trauma also so, so is is there uh, uh, there is the, the, any please, difference sorry. in tidal volume peep or respiratory rate in perioperative period yes sir uh, tidal volume uh, one thing is that we should be uh, keep small tidal volume as yes, preferably 6 to 8 ml per kg of tidal volume and respiratory rate also we should start from the least number i right? believe from 8 to 10 because there is high chance there is a what we expect uh, an expected complication in copd patients is generation of uh, auto peep and hyperdynamic hyperinflation of the lungs in which their uh, air gets trapped in the uh terminal airway causing uh, rise in the accumulation of this air, air before a complete expiration can generate auto peep so that is one uh, expected complication in intraoperative complication so to avoid that yeah. we should uh, and, 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 strategy proper integrated strategy like providing so, and and therefore manish it uh, because you know the only thing that you are concerned with in copd is a long uh, prolonged time constant of expiration so the only thing that you need to do to uh, avoid dynamic hyperinflation and peep is to uh, let the expiratory time be 4 to 5 times the tc of uh, no the time constant of expiration 
therefore you can use either volume control and pressure control it will not make any difference as long as you ensure that the lungs are you know that the alveoli are emptied completely uh, at the time of expiration which is just by providing a long expiratory time it will definitely not make any difference whatsoever to the outcome whether you using uh, volume control or you are using pressure control use what you are comfortable with yes correct yes uh, is there any difference in ie ratio in copd patient yes sir we should definitely give more time for expiration so uh, we should uh, start from a ie ratio of 1 is to 3 at least 1 is to 3 uh, then uh, looking on the parameters like eqco2 and peak pressure we, they they will be able to guide us to uh, whether the expiration is going on we can also see the scalars also like the pressure time scalars and the flow volume loop scalars they will be able to guide us if there is adequate expiration or not so starting from 1 is to 3 or 1 is to 3.5 we can keep for maximum of 2 is to 4 any, by reducing the rate is there any role of corticosteroid in such case i think uh, we had answered this question yeah yeah yes sir so, my question is in the case of emergency like okay for thyroid acute obstruction is there any role of like uh, iv steroids should we prefer sir only only if the inhaled bronchodilator is not working only if the nebulized bronchodilator uh, be it salbutamol or epitropium uh, if it is not working then yes you would definitely want bronchodilation and uh, in that case you would have to resort to an intravenous steroid if if your uh, beta 2 agonists or anticholinergics are not working i i hope the uh, query is well answered sir uh, uh, dr manish one more query uh, will there be uh, any change in the induction agent uh, what in induction agent uh, will you use for your case in uh, in this case of if the patient is for coming as an uh, uh, emergency case where the, if the hemodynamics are allowing us to we should see the patient's clinical status also for the induction agent to choose if it is an elective case of course my choice of agent will be iv uh, induction with propofol because it's a very good bronchodilator along, along with it suppress the airway reflexes but in case of a, uh, a patient is in, in hemodynamic shock in case of an obstructive uh, hernia and which the patient is already in shock his hemodynamics is very unstable in that case uh, i will choose uh, iv induction with ketamine uh, 1 to 1.5 mg per kg as itself it's a very potent bronchodilator and itself i can raise mean arterial pressure uh, so in unstable patients i could go for ketamine or if the patients who we, we know that is a known case of cardiac if patient is cardio cardio uh, Um, cardio system wise, if it is very unstable, whose ejection fractions we know that he is uh, not good, whose case of right ventricular failure. In such case, we can also go for ectomolator to to avoid hemodynamic complications. So, based on the clinical status, we should be able to select the IV. And agents. which which muscle relaxant you want to use for this uh, for intubation as well as for maintenance of anesthesia? And how which volatile agent you want to use? And what are the advantage of that what let tail agent over the other so for for muscle relaxant we it's for our concern should be to avoid uh, atracurium because there is a risk of uh, elevated instrument release which can provoke bronchospasm in this patient so rocuronium vicuronium and uh, cisatracurium would be the safest as it will, it will not provoke that much of instrument release rocuronium and vicuronium as very much safe also cisatracurium also can consider and where in case of maintaining the anesthesia uh, it, it would be preferable preferably i'll be maintain the case on uh, co fluorine because it's a less purla, uh, less irritant to the airways and uh, it will be uh, cardiac stable also and uh, uh, considering uh, desflurane should be totally avoided it's a purla, it's a pungent to the airways and it will provoke uh, arrhythmias also to the patient and uh, uh, isoflurane also we can consider if the to main case of maintaining the intraoperative general anesthesia isoflurane can also be considered uh, coflurane or isoflurane will be my choice preferably what about allotin what about allotin you are allotin is a high risk of uh, uh, making the patient sensitize the myocardium to arrhythmogenic it has arrhythmogenic property so earlier allotin used to use but now in modern scenario allotin has less role we are not using in you now in institute also because now nowadays coflurane is available uh, easily and it is better agent to use this yes. agent so coflurane uh, is better 
Dr. Kiran, uh, you might you may ask your question kindly and you can please ask your question. Dr. Kiran, kindly unmute and please ask your question. Okay, Dr. Manish, one more query from the chat box. Suppose you have intubated the trachea in your case. What will be your technique of extubation? Will it be uh, awake extubation versus uh, deep extubation, considering the hyper airway in COPD patients? And COPD patient is to be preferable to extubate with the patient under deeper planes of anesthesia. Suppose uh, because uh, any stimulation of the airway in the lighter plane of anesthesia could be triggered for bronchus person in this patient. So uh, we have nowadays we are very well known with familiar with the Bailey's manual. So one thing would be if the patient is already on intubated. Uh, so in deeper planes of anesthesia, we can consider Bailey's manual in which we uh, secure the airway, uh, remove the ET tube, uh, endotracheal tube, and uh, secure the airway with the uh, uh, so the second generation supraglottic airway device uh, in the deeper plane. And once the patient becomes fully awake and smarter and all the parameters for extubations uh, come back, in that case, under lighter planes of anesthesia, with lesser airway manipulation, we can remove the supraglottic airway device. So I will definitely prefer for a, a deeper plane of extubation or consider Bailey's manual. Uh, Manoj sir and Vikram sir, your opinion on it? But we you also should consider for other factors like difficulty in Okay, okay, got it, got it. Vikram uh, sir and Manoj sir, your opinion on this question? Dr. Manoj? Uh, yes, uh, we are regularly using Bally's manual in most of the cases uh, who are having like just neurosurgery cases or some COPD patients. We extubate the patient in deeper plane over the Bally's manual using the Bally's manual. And uh, I think it is safer option because till patient become fully awake, there is no tube in the uh, opening of vocal cord. So it less irritate the uh, uh, airway. So I think it is better and we are using regularly this uh, technique. So I think we have a consensus here. We have a consensus. Okay. Extubate in a deeper plane and uh, with the loose maneuver. So I think if anybody uh, else uh, want to ask any question, kindly unmute and please ask the question. So what are the indications of pre-op ABG? Uh, the, the, the only indication of a pre-operative ABG is if you feel that your patient, you know, is, uh, is uh, uh, antidotic for some reason or the other. And therefore, you would want to remove carbon dioxide before you uh, proceed with the induction of anesthesia. Now, uh, for this patient, if you're talking about when this patient was posted a little, he had very good meds, uh, completely conscious oriented. Uh, so I don't think there is any place for doing an ABG uh, analysis in this patient uh, as long as this patient was posted electively. Uh, even for an emergency, until and unless I uh, see clinical signs of acidosis, I would be reluctant to, uh, I mean, I would not really be very uh, enthusiastic about doing an ABG. Much? Yes, uh, yes, in this case, uh, ABG is not required. But whenever there is severe uh, severity of uh, COPD is more, then uh, respiratory rate is uh, very high or we are expecting some acidosis or respiratory acidosis, then it is only indicated. or uh, And it uh, more of hell, uh, helpful for prediction of post-operative requirement of post-operative ventilation or need of ICU. So in if very severe case is there, then only uh, ABG is required in pre-operative area. And we also have to keep... Uh, you know, uh, sorry, 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 sir. Sorry. Please, please continue. Please continue. I was just... I was just saying that the hands are standing up and you can ask questions. You can't unmute yourself. Read me note 11. Kindly unmute and please ask the question. Sir, how about going about the oxygen therapies in these patients uh, in post-operative period and about venturi, uh, use of venturies in these patients when they are having desaturation in the post-operative period? Can you please uh, sir, tell something about it, sir? Sir? Uh, did you get the question? The question is uh, the oxygenation strategies in the post-operative period. What would be the target oxygen 
PAO2 levels in the post operative period and the role of injury mask Dr Manish you can take that query followed by Vikram sir or Manoj sir Kindly unmute kindly unmute please Yes, sir. So it should be based on the uh, criteria of the to whether to provide oxygen supplementation to this patient. Based on, if the patient is restless, suppose his respiratory rate is more than 30, and in the ABG value that we take in the postoperative period, in view of a respiratory distress that we have seen, if the PAO2 is coming down, it's like around 50, 45 to 50 in range, and the BCO2 is in the elevating trend. In such case, our, the pH is going toward the acidic side less than 7.35 and so in such patients we definitely should consider oxygen therapy in this patient either it should be very uh, very good if we have an NIV support uh, non-invasive ventilation support in the post-operative period um, uh, it would be better to uh, oxygen the patient uh, with an NIV uh, or if the patient is not that much of uh, respiratory distress we can consider oxygen therapy we have face mask or uh, preferably with a venturi face mask to kind of guide the uh, FiO2 and to maintain a saturation of 88 to 92 percent in the post period. So, so what I feel is that you know a, a lot of these patients uh, are actually on uh, on a on a hypoxic drive of ventilation, right? And we have no way of finding out which one of these patients are on a hypoxic drive. So uh, what I would do is that until unless the saturation the the, the peripheral oxygen saturation SpO2 is less than 89 to 90 percent, I would not touch oxygen. Okay, I would only use oxygen if the saturation goes below 89 or 90% when the patient is at a risk of clinical hypoxia. If the saturation goes below that, then yes, I would use uh, any uh, oxygen device that is available to me while ensuring that uh, the FiO2 does not go over 80 to 90%. Now, if I'm using a, a simple uh, a Hudson's mask or a face mask, then even with flows of say six to seven or eight liters per minute, I would not be going over uh, 65 uh, an FiO2 of 65 to 70%. If I need uh, any uh, FiO2 uh, which is greater than 60 to 70%, in that case, yes, I might want to use a, a, a venturi. But otherwise, a Hudson mask would suffice in most of these cases. And I would certainly not supplement oxygen until unless there is a clear, uh, you know, a, a clear uh, signal on the monitor or in the patient uh, which. Uh, you know, which tells me that the patient is hypoxic. I would not use supplemental oxygen. Yes, I am fully agree with uh, Dr. Vikram because whenever there is need of oxygen, whenever saturation is less than 90%, then we uh, offer the patient oxygen to the patient because we have to keep, uh, maintain the hypoxic drive of that patient also. So that is the decision to supplement oxygen is also very important. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, we would like to now uh, conclude the session, but before that, I would like to say that I'd a big round of applause to the presenter, Dr. Manish Mohan. Absolutely. It's not it, it's not easy to come forward in a in a gathering of more than four hundred audience. Uh, come with so much of courage, determination, and positiveness. I don't think he missed out any question. He 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 took chances on all the questions, and he was bang on. Almost all the questions, that is the preparation that uh, he came up with in today's uh, session. And uh, a big round of applause to you. That will also give a great deal of encouragement to all other postgraduates to come up in future presentations. Uh, secondly, a uh, big thank you to ISA uh, for coming up with this unique uh, idea of uh, conducting uh, long uh, case sessions also in future. Uh, we'll be coming up with uh, short cases so as to make the uh, postgraduates more and more exam oriented as to how they should be uh, you know, uh, appearing in the exams and how they, uh, they, they present in the exams. And uh, nevertheless, a big, big uh, uh, thank you to uh, both the moderators uh, for being uh, uh, so much uh, participating in the event, uh, both the uh, moderators. Thank you so much, sir, from the entire ISA team. Uh, your participation has been tremendous and great contribution towards this first uh, long case uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, this video will again be available on ISA YouTube channel and uh, ISA website.
and uh, do follow the session again uh, for uh, revisions. So I thank uh, all, everyone for participating in today's event. And I also thank uh, Bajwa sir uh, for his active participation as he's a great mentor, uh, Navin Malhotra sir and all the other faculty uh, who, who are involved in this uh, uh, conducting the, uh, such kind of programs. So thank you very much. I'd like to conclude the session. Uh, we will meet again uh, on next uh, Monday that uh, that is 6 30 to 7 30 pm thank you dr ankur my suggestion is for long case we have to keep time for one and a half hour because it is very uh, i think one hour is very uh, short time because we want to include more and more questions uh, for the benefit of the pg student so that is my suggestion that uh, it can be include 1.5 hour then then it is okay I sure, so. sir. We will take this suggestion to ISA National. Uh, they will uh, take a, a collective decision on it, sir. Thank you yeah. so much, sir. Thank, Thank you so much. Sir. Don't worry about it. Dr. Manoj, your comments kindly, uh, I think, are good, noted, and it will be done like that only. First of yes. all, I like to actually congratulate Manish. She did a wonderful job. The preparation was good, courageous. And uh, I think any way se koi external bhi aa sakta hai, jinnoza sun rahe the aaj. So yeah, Manish, you, you will be uh, well prepared only. I have any external coming from this panel who has who ever been listening today, and well moderated by Dr. Manoj and Dr. Vikram. It's really nice and heartwarming that this was a first case presentation of, uh, on our ISA platform, and it has gone well. And we will be coming with more case presentation in the coming days. And uh, it will be more on a modified version. The feedback will continue and uh, we will be improving with every case discussion, every class. And for the next class, we have got uh, the pulmonary function test. And after that, we will have one more case presentation of the respiratory system before we conclude the respiratory system. And we will start with the cardiovascular. So uh, from ISA National, from on behalf of all the governing councils and our representatives, we really thank the moderators and the presenter and all the audience who has spared their precious time. And we like that all the postgraduates to regularly attend these classes because these are going to be very beneficial during their examination as well as their clinical assessment and knowledge. So heartiest thank to all my team also, Ankur and Dr. Nishan, Dr. Parul and all others whosoever are thank there. You, so and uh, next class we will be meeting at 6.30 and till then, Goodbye from uh, Dr. Naveen want to ask say something. Dr. Naveen, kindly unmute yourself. Dr. I just Naveen. want to say God bless the speaker. Manish, God bless you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Would like to and thank, thank the you. All the ISA members. Thank you, Manoj and uh, Dr. Vikram. Uh, Pleasure, sir. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. If, if, if I would have been the, your examiner for the MD, you would, you would have definitely passed with flying colors. God bless you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. And uh, good night from the ISA National Headquarters. And see you next Monday at 6.30 sharp. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Vikram and Manish. Thank you, Manish. All the best, Manish. Thank you, 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 Manish. Thank you,